literally is basically just such a thin coat. Welcome. On behalf of ResiBuild, I'd like to introduce the next stop in our roadshow. We're here today in Manchester in Maple Sunscreening and we're glad to be looking at an agenda which is looking particularly at fire and fire versus sustainability. So without further ado, I'll move on to giving a bit of an overview. So we've got two presentations here today. Um, as I say, the focus is on fire and fire and sustainability within the external envelope. And we've got a presentation from a university lecturer, um, also representing Delta Fire. Um, quite a coincidence, but we're, um, we'll be introducing shortly Joe Hart here in Manchester. Um, you don't believe he used to be a goalkeeper though. Um, for those here live, um, I believe the fire escapes are down the end of the building. Um, if we could have um, phones off or on silent, please, that'd be much appreciated. Um, and welcome to many of you live streaming in. So the roadshow so far, we started it on the 1st of June in Reading. Um, we then moved across to Ireland where we did a presentation and a roadshow in Dublin at Croke Park. And we then moved up to Belfast where we live streamed a fire test. Um, we were testing a stub guard, um, a scenario where a balcony anchor is penetrating a facade and we were live streaming and, re and responding to questions about how fire testing is done, what the purpose of it and the limitations. And we also saw a panel discussion there with a range of people representing different parts of the market from insurance through to the National Fire Chief Council. Um, we're here now in Manchester uh, where we start the northern part of um, the roadshow and fairly shortly tomorrow we'll be moving on to Leicester. Once um, we hear the end of this month, we'll then be moving on to Canada, 
where our colleagues, um, our Resibuild colleagues over in North America will be starting from Vancouver and moving across to the east of the country, going via um, Alberta, where they're stopping at Edmonton and Calgary, moving on to Winnipeg, um, then on to Ontario, where they're stopping at Ottawa, then on to Quebec, where they're stopping at Montreal, and then lastly, stopping at the Sapphire Balcony showroom in Toronto, um, where there'll be a showdown between two different types of methods. So this is quite an interesting one. There'll be um, balconies being installed um, in two ways, the traditional way in Canada, which is concrete balconies versus metal balconies being installed. Um, you can sign up to all of those on www.resi.build. Um, as we go through today, um, for those of you on the live stream, you've probably got a QR code or a link in front of you anyway. Um, but anyone who wants to ask questions, you can scan this code um, and it will take you to www.sli.do. Um, that's the live stream we've been using for all of these venues so far. Um, and the hashtag is ask. Um, that should um, put you in touch with us directly. And any questions which come through this route, we will be asking um, as we go through the presentations today. So thanks for your participation. We've had really good particip participation so far. Um, you can follow the rest of the trip um, on live stream via resi.build. Um, you can also access the past and the future recordings on our YouTube page, ResiBuild YouTube page, and also the LinkedIn page for ResiBuild. Giving you a bit of context, um, ResiBuild is part of the ATW group. The ATW group um, has various companies, the largest of which is Sapphire. Um, I'm representing Sapphire here today um, and ResiBuild. Um, Sapphire is a balcony specialist. Um, my deck is a um, combustible, non-combustible um, decking manufacturer. Um, Woodridge build um, residential homes, particularly in Berkshire. Um, and Skies is serving end users um, of um, the high-rise apartment industry. So we trust you have a great day and enjoy this live stream. Um, and we look forward to welcoming you to the next Rosie Build Roadshow tomorrow. In the meantime, let me hand over to our first um, and well-respected speaker in the industry, Joe Hart. Thank you very much. Okay, sound and visual all looking good there. Thumbs up, perfect. Okay, cool, I'll, uh, I'll begin. So, good morning everyone, uh, both in the room and live streaming in. Thank you to Nick for the introduction there. Um, thank you also to Nick for inviting me along today and for Maple, our hosts uh, today here in Manchester. My name is Joe Hart. I'm gonna be talking today about external envelope fire safety, giving today's, today's keynote talk. This is a talk I've given before. Um, I've changed it ever so slightly today just to make sure we're talking about sustainability element as well, though I have spoken about sustainability at recent events as well. So, let me briefly introduce who I am. My name is uh, Joe Hart. Uh, I'm Group Director of the Delta Innovation Group. So I run three businesses there. First of all, Delta Fire Engineering. So we're a specialist engineering firm based in the Northwest of England. We're also Delta Fire Safety. So we are fire risk assessment, uh, compartmentation survey, and anything construction side during projects. Also retrospective work uh, on buildings across the UK. And Delta Fire Testing is our own testing lab that we're currently building, again, up in the northwest of England. I split my time. I'm also a lecturer in fire engineering at the University of Central Lancashire, where I teach fire engineering up to postgraduate level, specialising in delivery of industry-related modules, so work related to uh, buildings and projects we see out in industry, taking fire science principles into the kind of real-world application. So that's a bit about me. My contact details are on there. If anybody wants to get in touch, I'll share those at the end as well. And I'll go on to today's talk, which is about fire safety in the external envelope. So, I always start really high level. I'll start particularly high level today just with our building regulations requirement. We, uh, so we have our overall requirement, it's a functional requirement for fire safety for external fire spread. All of, our fun all of our requirements in terms of the building regs are functional. It doesn't tell us exactly what to do, nor does it tell us how to achieve it. It gives us an open to interpretation regulation we have to abide by. So regulation B4 relates to external fire spread, and in B41 it says, I put in, uh, in bold just there, 
The external wall shall adequately resist the spread of fire over the walls and from one building to another. It doesn't tell us what adequately is. It doesn't define that term. That's for us as designers to determine how we define adequate. But we have to input into the design of the external wall, the external envelope, to make sure that we meet that requirement. Ultimately, we are liable against that requirement if a fire occurs and we haven't designed the building appropriately. The second bullet point on there brings in a term called risk-based. All of this functional requirement system is inherently risk-based. It's up to the designer to determine the risk of fire spread that might occur. And from there, we have to make some decisions in our design uh, and, and remediation sorry, of buildings. Now we have, for anyone not from a fire background, we have our approved documents. So approved document B is our primary document we have in fire. It's an approved code of practice, so if we follow the guidance within there, it will allow us to meet the, the legal requirements of the building regulations. It is only guidance though, we're not completely bound by it. But in order to make this um, functional system slightly easier, I suppose, or to give us a clue, the Secretary of State does give us the intention of the building reg. So within each of the uh, building regulation sections of the approved document B, it gives us some idea of what it is we should be designing to meet that definition of adequate. So the first one that's on screen there, it says that the risk of ignition by external source to the outside surface of the building and spread over the fire of fire over the outside surface is restricted. Again, restricted isn't a defined term. It doesn't say it shouldn't spread more than three metres. It doesn't say it shouldn't spread beyond one compartment. It just says it should be restricted. And secondly, the materials used to construct external walls and attachments to them and how they're assembled do not contribute to the rate of fire spread up the outside of the building. So we're starting to get an understanding of what we actually have to physically design to meet this functional requirement. Now, I should have said at the beginning, I do lots of talks and I normally put a disclaimer whenever I've got some images. I have a photo of the Grenfell Tower fire on the next slide, so anyone who's on live stream, do feel free to uh, look away from the screen, anyone in the room similarly. Um, it's just a photograph that's in the public domain from uh, a news article. When we talk about fire spread over the external face and we're trying to define adequate, the way that we go about doing that as engineers and designers is we first of all carry out what we call a, rev a reverse root cause analysis. So a root cause analysis is something that looks for contributory factors and things that might influence the way that an event might occur, for example, a fire. And if we start to identify those risks and how they might happen, or those hazards and how likely they are to occur, we start to design out those risks. It's a kind of reverse engineering process. And of course, what we do is we look to case studies such as the one on screen there. We look to worst case scenarios that we consider. We look at the hazards that might occur and how likely they are, and we, we design out those risks. So as engineers and researchers, it's important that we study these failure modes. It's important that we understand what can go wrong so we can design out those risks to prevent those things from going wrong again. And the way we do that is we often look at historic fires, such as six years almost to the day. It doesn't feel that historic, um, but certainly within living memory, it's a very significant fire for us to be considering when we're doing this. And when we look to mechanisms of fire spread that we try to mitigate, we try to design against, we have three mechanisms in terms of fire engineering, um, how external fire spread may occur. Now, the first of these is what's called direct flame impingement. If a flame physically touches a surface, it's likely, if that surface is combustible, that the flame will spread to that secondary surface. So the first thing we try to design out is what's called direct flame impingement. The way we do that as engineers is we make sure that buildings are sufficiently far apart to make sure that that spread can't occur. It's called space separation. And the example on screen there is from an event I went to a few years ago that recreated the Great Fire of London. And the Great Fire of London is a perfect example of this. Tightly packed together buildings made out of timber, flames directly impinged on the building next door, and we got the mass conflagration that occurred there. The second mechanism is what we call flying brands. So material from a fire that spreads by wind to uh, a secondary, uh, secondary building or structure, whatever it might be, uh, can cause that fire to spread. And I'm going on Saturday this week to California to go and look at some of the wildfires over there. I'm over there for a week. And this is exactly the sort of fire spread mechanism we get in what we call a wildland urban interface, where we have a wildfire that spreads to an urban area. And the third one is called radiation. So if we have radiation spread, so if we've got two elements that are close enough together that the heat from that primary fire can cause ignition of the second one, uh, that's called fire spread by radiation. And those are our three main mechanisms. And what we're doing here is what I do when I'm teaching at the university. I take a fire science principle and apply it to real life design of buildings. 
The way we do that is by spacing buildings far apart. If they're closer together, they have to have different combustibility, so they have to be non-combustible. We talk about flying brands. We design air buildings that are in high wildland or wildfire areas to have less combustible material on them. And radiation spread here, again, we spread buildings apart. We space them further apart if there's a higher risk of them igniting. This is a fire investigation I did in, in Spain a few years ago where there was a fire in a chalet and it spread very rapidly to all the chalets next door. You can see the way that's happened um, because the wall closest to the chalet that's on fire ignites first. I've never quite worked out what that firefighter is doing in the second building, but uh, I presume there was also fire inside who was looking to fight. So the way we map this out is with a schematic like this. Now this is a familiar schematic for any fire engineer, any architect uh, potentially working in fire safety. The way that we design the three mechanisms of fire spread into a building, we look to mitigate radiation, uh, space separation by flame impingement, and burning brands. Now that's as technical as the presentation gets. We get less technical now, we'll be pleased to hear. But that's our standard model for external fire spread. And there is one more thing we need to consider, which is really pertinent for us in the design of the external envelope, which is not just the risk of a fire spreading from one building to another building, which is our standard definition of external fire spread. The other thing we have to consider is fire spread on the same building via the external wall. So we do a lot of work to design the interior of a building to contain a fire to one compartment. We do things like put fire doors in, compartment walls, uh, fire stopping. Uh, I was just chatting earlier on before we came in to, um, to present about, about half an hour ago actually, about fire stopping products. So we use a small fire stop around a penetration through a compartment wall to prevent fire spread. And we have to relate this to the external wall as well because we can compromise the internal fire strategy very easily by designing the external wall incorrectly. So another model we bring in here is flame propagation on the outside face. Now that can happen horizontally or vertically. If we get a fire that spreads to uh, the external of the building, if that can spread around the outside, it can also then spread back into the building as well, which is a huge uh, risk for us. We can have fire spread within the cavity. So where we have a complex external wall system with a cavity uh, inside, if we get unseen fire and smoke spread, that imposes a huge risk to our building as well. Should that occur, whether it's on the outside face or whether it's in the cavity, we can very easily get fire spread to another compartment, so to another flat on the floor above, or to from commercial to residential on floors above. It can be floors below or side uh, lateral spread as well, but basically to any compartment outside of, or any external combustion that's sustained at all. So. External fire spread is a very complex element to design for fire safety, particularly with an external envelope, which is an inherently complex system. And one thing that we have to do as designers and, and researchers and, and fire engineers is look at holistic design. So we can't consider just one component of the external wall and design a fire strategy for that. It has to be the strategy for how all these components work together, how the overall system works holistically, and how that ties into the fire strategy as well. And we'll go on at the end of the presentation to talk about the risk appraisal process we use for existing buildings under the past document and how we use those exact principles of holistic design and how it might impact the fire strategy. So, I've said that it's very difficult for us to do. There's lots of things we have to do as fire engineers to consider. A bit flickering on my screen. I'll just toggle the wire a second and all's good, all's well. Um, there's lots of things we have to do in terms of external fire spread, and it breaks down fundamentally to three things that we can do. There are three parts of an external wall envelope that we can input into as fire engineers and as specifiers for an external wall system. So the first one of those is we have a choice over the material on the external face. So going back to the mechanisms of fire spread, one of them was propagation along the external wall itself. So it was if a flame touches that external surface, how long Will it resist spread horizontally and vertically along that wall? So we can have an impact on, just where the screen is flickering right there, I'll point to it, on what that outer material is, the physical material that we look at as we look at the outside face of a building. The second thing that we can input into is the choice of materials within the external wall buildup. So not only what we see as we look at the outside face of the building, but also any component we have interior to that as well. So anything from the internal wall build-up to that outer surface, any cavity barriers, insulation, UV layers, vapour control layers, anything within there we can specify for fire safety. 
And thirdly, we have an impact on the cavity. We've said before, if there's a cavity that's in, uh, created as part of an external wall system, we can seek to subdivide that cavity in some way. I'm going to step to the side and keep talking um, while we play about with the flickering. We can attempt to subdivide the cavity in some way so that if we get fire and smoke spread into that cavity, fixed it, Ooh, nearly fixed it. It was better when I was over here, wasn't it? Good, I'll keep talking. <laughs> um, we, we can subdivide that cavity. So what we can aim to do is to make sure that if we get fire or smoke in there, it's restricted. It doesn't spread to compartments. And we have, of course, a couple of legal requirements. Anything in fire safety is subject to usually quite strict legal requirements. Um, perhaps the biggest complexity is how often legal requirements change for fire safety at the moment. Again, we were talking just over a coffee before I came in to present about legal requirements and how often they change at the moment. Really broad fundamentals for fire at the moment. We have our building regulations that we've discussed, but we also have our building amendment regs from 2018, which do impose some legal requirements in terms of the external wall and the materials we can use. Secondly, we have what we call the Regulator Reform Fire Safety Order 2005. Now, this is a really key piece of legislation for existing buildings. This piece of legislation says that we have to go and risk assess buildings while they're occupied. They have to be risk assessed, and that uh, assessment has to be reviewed frequently, periodically. People say annually. Technically, it's not the case. But generally, we go back at regular intervals to assess. And if we look at high-rise buildings, historically, this assessment only considered the inside of the building. And that was until 2021, where there was a confirmation that actually this regular risk assessment has to include the external facade of the building as well. So if we have a high-rise residential building, for example, we now also have to consider, we always had to consider, but it was clarified in 2021, the external wall. We have to do a risk assessment of that wall periodically, perhaps annually, perhaps every two years. And then just another requirement that snuck in uh, last year, the Fire Safety England regs now confirms that the responsible person for a building has to understand their external wall and they have to give that information, um, they have to compile that information for a residential building that's high rise and keep that uh, documented and provide it to their local authority and uh, other relevant bodies as well. So we have a really key legal requirement now, not just for new builds where a designer would come in and specify, which is impacted by our building amendment regs, but also for new builds, uh, sorry, for existing buildings as well. We have to go back and appraise existing buildings and see what we've got on these high rise and high risk buildings. Perhaps remediate some of these. There are huge remediation projects happening up and down the country where a failure of the risk, risk appraisal determines that the risk is too high and it has to be reassessed, which takes a building back into the design stage later in its building life cycle. And I'm going to talk just briefly to, to end on, really, for, for the last few minutes, about how we go about doing that process. So if we have an existing building that has a complex external wall system on it, we have a legal requirement now to understand that external wall, potentially have a requirement to remediate that external wall. But regardless, we have to understand what's there and keep that on record. So how do we go about appraising existing buildings? And last year, we got a new methodology to allow us to do that. So that's called the PASS 9980. Uh, document. It provides a methodology for us to risk appraise. I'm not going to teach in this particular uh, speech today how to do one of these seminars, but there's something I want to pull out of it that's really important because it goes back to my concept of holistic design, holistic, holistic risk assessment for external walls. Now, just to introduce it in a little bit more depth, um, the PASS 9980 was introduced last year. It was sponsored by the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Local Communities. Um, and the Home Office came into effect as of 31st of Jan last year, so it's been in place for coming up to 18 months now. It doesn't provide an absolute level of safety. What it seeks to do, actually, is to risk assess, provide a risk-based approach to existing buildings. And it is used, can be used by specialists, to meet that legal requirement to assess existing buildings that have got cladding systems on them, external wall systems, complex envelopes on the outside of the building. I put a quote in there in italics, usually anything in my, in my talks that are italicised are uh, direct quotes, in this case it's from the past itself. It says that no code of practice can ever provide guidance for all possible circumstances. And that is especially true, uh, I think, of external wall and external envelopes, because there are so many components could be involved in there. They can be fitted in a certain way. If the depth of a cavity changes by 10%, does that change its fire properties? 
you could shrug it off and think no, but actually it has a huge impact. Um, all these different components that come into play means that this code of practice doesn't apply to them all, but what it does give us is a risk-based approach. And the way in which it does that is by considering three things. We consider, and this, it's worth saying, is the methodology we apply when we look at existing or actually new builds as well. It's the exact same process, in, uh, in my opinion. So, we look at the materials to be used on the external wall. That's the first component. We look at the fire properties of each of those. Secondly, we look at the configuration of those materials. So, how are they laid out in the building? Are they touching each other? Are they coincident? And do they run the length of a building or are they isolated? Are they contained within non-combustible materials? All these different iterations lead to a different determination of the configuration. And thirdly, how, does, how do these materials and the way that they're set on the building, how do they impact the overall fire strategy for the building? So the strategy for an external wall is not in isolation. It's not its own strategy. It has to relate to the rest of the building. And we've got an example coming up, but just to pluck another one from, from top of the head, if we have a stay put policy in a high rise block of flats, we're reliant on a fire being contained to a single compartment and not spreading beyond. So we have a higher reliance for our external wall to not propagate flame. If we have a simultaneous evacuation, we don't have that stay put policy. There's less reliance on it, but we may determine it's adequate that it doesn't spread beyond one floor above the flat of fire origin or the compartment of fire origin. So these three things are really fundamental. We look at the materials in the building or on the outside of the building, should I say, the way in which they're orientated, so the configuration of them, and thirdly, how they impact the overall fire strategy of the building. And to look at the way in which we actually adopt that, just to give a couple of, uh, couple of examples. Well, first of all, we look at what's the risk of the building when we first appraise it. Is it a low, medium or high risk? It usually starts down at high risk level, otherwise we wouldn't be assessing the existing building. It's usually deemed to have a high risk in place. And what we look for are what we call indicators, positive, neutral or negative indicators for loads of different parameters. We look at individual components and we say, does the position of that component in the external wall overall give a positive or a negative influence to the building? And similarly for every other component, does the fact that the balconies are vertically aligned, which is a very timely one, I was reading LinkedIn this morning and looking at everyone sharing a video of a fire that happened over the weekend, does the fact that they're vertically aligned, the balconies, have a positive or a negative impact? And as we do this, we're looking at the risk, but we're also doing that reverse root cause analysis I mentioned at the beginning of the talk because what we're looking for is potential solutions. So if the fact that they're vertically aligned, just plucking that example again, is the highest risk, well, if we can offset those balconies in some way, it removes that risk. We're, we're developing design solutions in this case. So a couple of examples I have for each of the three. The first one we said is the materials used in the balcony, uh, not the balcony necessarily, just I was looking at Nick when I said that, sorry, Nick, um, used in the external envelope of the building. Could be a balcony though. Um, in this example, it isn't, though. It's just a material used in the external wall build-up. So we look at a material that's used there, and we go and we look at the combustibility of it. Now, I promise we didn't get much more technical. This one's slightly technical. Um, we look at what's called the gross heat of combustion of that material. We can physically take a material and assess its calorific value. When it burns, how much energy does it give out? And we can get a number. So if we take a component from an external wall system, a piece of insulation, an exposed piece of decking, powder coating that goes on a, an aluminium fin, powder coating that goes on an aluminium deck. We can look at what the calorific value of that material is and determine if that's positive, neutral or negative to the building. Now we say something between three and 35 is neutral. That's a fairly standard piece of material. Timber is about 15 megajoules per kilogram. So we're around that kind of level of combustibility. Really low combustibility, less than three megajoules per kilogram, we'd say is a positive indicator because that's not going to contribute a huge amount of, uh, of energy to a potential fire. Whereas if it's over 35 megajoules per kilogram, really highly combustible. Petrol has a calorific value of 45 megajoules per kilogram. Certain insulation materials have calorific values beyond 45 megajoules per kilogram. So we look for these incredibly high risk materials because they would give us a negative indicator in this case. I touched the screen then and it beeped at me, sorry. <laughs> um, so that could be a negative indicator. Similarly going on and looking at the way that the balconies or the external walls are laid out. This configuration is important to us as well. Is it positive, negative, or neutral? So the example we've got here is the height of the base of the cladding above the ground. If we say that from ground level to five meters, there's no cladding and the system begins above there, that's a positive indicator because there's a very low risk of a 
bin fire, car fire, some other secondary means of uh, fire, is going to spread to that cladding system. Whereas if that cladding system begins less than two metres, if it comes all the way down to ground level, there's a much higher risk that we'll get um, a secondary source of ignition causing our cladding to ignite. And somewhere in the middle between two and five, again, is neutral indicator. So we're looking at individual components for existing buildings and looking at whether the component itself gives a positive or negative influence to the building. And then the third one that we'd have is fire strategy indicators. We go and we look at the building on the whole. We look at actually, when we're doing a review of the external of the building, we look inside the building. One thing that's really important to do, we look at where the stair is. Is the stair fire protected? Is it ventilated? Is it pressurized? In this example here, I've plucked different examples throughout the past document. There are lots of these to run through. I've taken compartmentation. So compartmentation, we'd say it's a negative indicator if it's missing. It would be a neutral indicator if in a block of flats we have compartmentation because we need it anyway, so it's not an enhancement. Perhaps if we had enhanced compartmentation, higher fire resistance, we'd fire rated bathrooms and all protected entrance hallways, things like that, positive indicator. So we take these individual things and we're looking holistically at what is in place on the building. Materials, configuration and influence on the overall fire strategy. And what we do with that is we take the outcome, we take the initial baseline and we determine can we move ourselves away from high risk based on what's on the building? So have we looked at all the materials, the calorific value of the materials we've got on the building, the condition of the materials, the way that they're laid out, does that lead us or tend us away from high risk? Then we look at the orientation of them. Do we not have vertically stacked combustible materials on a building? Are they isolated and contained within um, non-combustible materials and insulation? Again, tend us this way. Fire strategy and fire hazards, the third one we look at. Do we have an overall comprehensive fire strategy that's well maintained, well documented and designed well? Again, might lead us down to the low end of the, uh, of the spectrum there. So that's the way we go about appraising an existing block. And in actual fact, we use very similar principles when we're doing new build design as well. We look at what we've got going on the building holistically. We have to look at components, but actually we have to look at them and how they operate together not just their material properties. So phone calls I get very often, does this need to be class A2? Does this need to be non-combustible? First question I ask back is, what is it and where does it sit on the building? Because that's relevant information for us. Secondly, the orientation. So how does that sit in the overall building? And thirdly, tell me a bit more about the building. So what building are we looking at and what's the overall strategy? What are we trying to achieve by doing the external wall classification here? Now, don't be thrown off by the pun. Anyone who's familiar with my work will know all my research has a pun title. Um, it is a serious piece of work. Does size really matter? In terms of building height, when we're looking at the risk, does the size of the building matter? Now, it does from a regulatory perspective. We have different regulations for different buildings. But in actual fact, from a risk perspective, no. We can have a high-risk building that's low-rise, or we can have a low-rise building that's higher risk than a high-rise that's designed correctly. If we identify something like a two-storey dementia care home, the objective risk of that building to the residents there, when we're looking holistically, is higher than a three-storey student residential building, where everyone is arguably compass, mentors, um, but familiar with their surroundings, a well-designed building, probably got two stairs in it, versus a dementia care home where everyone requires assistance to escape. Objectively, risk is related to so many different parameters that we can't simply say the risk of a building is only proportionate to the height of it. It is directly related. The higher the building, the more stringent regulations and guidance we have. But we have to look beyond that as well and think about the overall risk, which is why when somebody phones me, if I've got my commercial hat on and says, does this, is this cavity barrier in the right place? I can't answer it on the phone. I need a follow up and say, what are we designing? Where's the building? What's the overall strategy and all these other things uh, in order to make that decision? Because it's inherently risk based. And the purpose, just to finish off, um, of doing that review is concerned with life safety. What we're trying to do is take an existing building or remediate a building and put uh, additional products on there to ensure that life safety is to a level that we deem is appropriate. The particular document we've looked at there, the, uh, the past guidance, doesn't relate to property protection or insurance requirements. It's very explicit. It only relates actually to life safety. But it does apply to a building of any height. You can use that and you may use that documentation for a building that's two storeys, our two-storey dementia care home, for example. Also, the outcome of the FRAW is intended to give recommendations, perhaps remedial measures, things that we might need to do to ensure that life safety is maintained to a suitable standard. 
And one point that's in, uh, well, a few points in bold, but one down at the bottom is that in order to do that, we have to go and look at the building itself. So we have to do an intrusive site inspection. Because if we take information about a building as it was designed and take it at face value, we're only ever reviewing how the building was intended to be built. And I spend enough time going and looking at buildings and taking a cladding panel off and realising it wasn't, or it, the current condition isn't as it was built. Because of subsidence or the way it was specified or the way it was installed, whatever it might be, if we're looking at risk, we really have to look at what do we actually have in front of us. So we find ourselves cutting holes in buildings, taking cladding panels off, looking at the physical construction in order for us to do a true appraisal of an existing building that we might have following a risk-based approach. And just to highlight the risk-based and show what we're always trying to do is limit the risk or not increase the risk. The, the photograph on screen there, some of you may be familiar with, we'll all have heard of it. That's Grenfell Tower before the cladding system was added to it. So that's what Grenfell Tower looked like before the remediation occurred that added on the cladding system. So when we look at risk base, we look at before and after and what was installed. Really pertinent. I should have put a disclaimer on and said another photo of Grenfell. But in actual fact, that looks like so many towers that we see out and about, out there in industry and on site. So to summarise just what I've gone through there, the external envelope itself is a really key component of a fire strategy and it's one of the most complex areas of design. Facades and envelopes themselves are complex enough without the fire engineer ringing you up and asking about materials as well. But for us in the fire industry, it's really key part of overall building safety. What we often do is what we call a reverse root cause analysis. We look for potential failure modes. We might study historic building fires. We might uh, think about single points of failure or duo points of failure. Once we identify those, we can try to design those out or engineer solutions to prevent those uh, uh, root causes from occurring. There are lots of different fire spread mechanisms and it highlights how complex this field is of external envelope design for fire safety because there's so many things that we have to consider. All different mechanisms, whether it be direct flame, radiant heat, flying brands, propagation on the outside, all of these fire dynamics are really crucial and any one of these could be a failure mode. Generally three ways that we go about assessing these, as I've said, it's the materials themselves, the way they're laid out on the building and the overall fire strategy. And we use a specific uh, appraisal system now to review existing buildings because as much as we look at design of new builds and we specify materials we also have a huge program of works out there for existing buildings that are being reviewed risk assessed and ultimately remediated in many cases as well so thank you for coming along and thank you for dialing in and, and watching my talk um, my name's joe again so i'm director of the delta innovation group our trio of companies and I'm also a lecturer at the University of Central Lancashire. Contact details are on there. I'm generally pretty good on the emails. This week, I'm speaking at two conferences in two days. So maybe give me three days to get back to you. Um, but I will endeavour to come back to anyone that has questions. Or if you've got questions live, do feel free to ask. I'll leave those on screen. We've got quite a few questions coming through. That's okay. Yeah, by all means. Yeah. Um, well, maybe someone raising here as well. Um, firstly, What important is our fire brands to high-rise high residential. Um, we're talking the brands that come, we're not talking brands companies here, we're talking about flying brands from fires, I would assume. So, yeah. I, okay, I shan't mention any brands if that was the question. Um, Flying brands high residential. Um, the truth is, it's really difficult to design against flying brands from fires. There's research that shows that a, a brand from a fire can be really, really small, and it can travel five, six hundred metres from a fire. So if we designed against burning brands, every building in Britain would have to be 600 metres apart, which just wouldn't work. So from a practical perspective, it's very difficult to design for that. If we have a high concentration of combustible material, what we have to start thinking about is how do we integrate different buildings into the same uh, fire strategy. So how do we consider if there's a building fire next door, it's likely we'll have it here. An area we see that very heavily is in recycling plant fires, where burning brands look similar to an external um, a wildland fire like that, where you get a really high proportion of burning brands. If I'm designing next to a, a site that I think might have a high proportion of this, I've done lots of work in Greece and Spain and areas where you get these, I tend to incorporate that into my design. I'll try to limit external wall components that are combustible and 
uh, exposed where I know I've got this risk. If the question is related to high-rise residential in Manchester or London, in truth, it's a relatively low risk that we would design for. We don't anticipate that, but when it occurs, it's also not unexpected because we know that these brands can travel five, six hundred metres. Yeah, absolutely. I'll repeat the question. Um, so Nick's then asked, are we designing both for the risk of a wildland fire or other similar fire spraying to our building and vice versa? Yes, absolutely. So we had quite bad fires around here a couple of years ago uh, and they inherently start banning barbecues and bin fires that you have at home. Construction sites can't burn waste anymore for that exact risk um, of trying not to spread a fire to the environment. Because another thing that we consider, back to our sustainability point, is not only life safety, property protection, but environmental. I know we've discussed this before, Nick, last year. Uh, we had a big talk about sustainability at another conference. We have to design so that we don't, to try and prevent that from occurring, that sort of fire. So yes, it does work both what we would call offensively and defensively. We try to both prevent a building fire spreading to, but also protect our building from, defensively, a fire like that. Yeah, the next question was, before part one was referred to in the fire at Barking, question about the fire embarking and about whether regulation if I if I understand the question correctly does the regulation B4 apply to a building that's lower than 18 meters I guess is what's inferred the answer is yes I mean the building regulation applies if you put a shed in your garden I mean that's an extreme example it probably doesn't but if you put a single story up and you go through building regs yes it applies so the the particular fire embarking I think it was the balcony fires that uh, that was quite notable happened during the day but also had a really high combustibility of external balconies that were vertically stacked and I think timber as well. Um, the performance requirement applies to any building that is constructed and goes through building regs so the short answer is yes it would apply. I mean regulation B4 again I'm going to skip back in my presentation if we're still sharing screen forgive me if we're not. Um, th that is a building regulation that applies to any building that goes through building regs approval so regardless of height. Does size really matter? No, is the answer. Did, did that actually get answered by the government, the MHC in Jersey was anyway? Into accordance with one of the advice notes, was it? In terms of whether that applies be, below? Correct. Yeah, yes. I mean, it's also explicit in the regs themselves and all our approved guidance that this is a requirement that applies to all buildings. So if I'm designing a single-storey supermarket, I'm bound by the same regulation as a 30-storey resi tower. The regulation itself doesn't change. Next question is, has 9980 mandatory for new buildings or old buildings or neither? The question is, is PAS 9980 mandatory for new buildings, existing buildings or neither? Was that right? Testing my memory here. Um, the answer is neither. It's not mandatory. It's a piece of guidance. You wouldn't need to use it for a new build because it is just for review of existing buildings and existing building risks. I have been asked to use it for a new building. Um, there is the EWS1 process, which is coming in well, no, has been in place for a long time, but it's increasingly being asked for new builds. Not strictly necessary from our perspective for fire safety. I certainly wouldn't need to do for a new build a fire risk appraisal. I don't need to construct a building, then go take a panel off and see what's there. I do that through the construction process. Nor is it mandatory for existing buildings. It's just a methodology to follow. So there has to be, from a legal perspective, again, I'm just going to keep referring back to my slides here, if that's all right. Keep going back to uh, legal requirement. It says we have to carry out a risk assessment of the external wall. How we choose to do that is up to us as risk assessors, clients, contractors, building operators. There is, it's just a method of doing that, um, a code of practice. So certainly not mandatory. No. Next question, uh, where would laminate glass sit on the risk factor? <laughs> where would laminate glass sit on a risk factor? Very good point. Big research topic. I've had a dissertation student do it this year. Um, I won't share their results, but in theory, it wouldn't meet the regulatory requirements for certain component, for components in certain parts of buildings. If I was looking at a risk factor, comparatively low. That doesn't mean low, but comparatively low to other materials is what I'll say. Is that a suitable answer? <laughs> I'm actually touching on it. <coughs> okay. Oh, perfect. Okay, good. Well, Nick's going to touch on it later and answer it um, less politically than I did. <laughs> um, how can you fire rate your bathroom? What difference? 
is to cough would be incurred. How can you fire rate a bathroom and what differences to costs will be incurred? So as a fire engineer, if I'm looking at the design of a uh, flat and I've got a protected entrance hallway, generally speaking, I'll say that the bathroom has really low uh, fire or negligible fire load. I won't say no fire load, negligible, really, really low. So if I'm designing the protected entrance hallway, I'm normally, when I'm teaching, I have a whiteboard in front of me, so I'll kind of wave my hands around a bit. Um, I would take the fire rated line around the side of the bathroom and allow that bathroom to open into my protected entrance hallway. If we were trying to enhance the building and put compartmentation everywhere, we could simply put a fire door on the bathroom and make sure it's self-closing, and we could fire rate the walls and components there. And instead of a 30-minute fire rated protected entrance hallway, make it 60 minutes, so an extra line of plasterboard. These are the sort of enhancements we might look for if we're trying to offset risk elsewhere in a building, because our standard design would be Bathrooms are included within protected entrance hallways. So if we're looking for enhancements, it might be they're not included, they're separated out. It's a true protected entrance hallway. I'm just going to jump back to laminate glass because we've had another follow-up question. Yep. Um, <clears throat> could we see laminate glass make a comeback after the ban, or is it likely to stay as a ban material beyond 2020? Could we see laminated glass uh, unbanned? Was that the question? Basically, yeah. Unbanned, basically. Um, we could. That's another political answer from me, unfortunately. Um, as someone who's researching this a little bit, I can't share my results without formally documenting it. Nick, are you going to touch on it as well later a little bit? Oh, yeah. Nick, will be touching on it as well? We could, with a capital C, would be my answer. Yes, absolutely. I'm not a decision maker on that, but as an objective kind of researcher and engineer and person that designs buildings, we could and indeed should in some cases. So that's opinion only. I can't, I don't make that decision, but... My opinion is, yes, we could. Um, and last question, now, is there a material we could use that would, both, would be both highly fire safe and sustainable, or do we have to weigh more favorably towards one than the other? Good question to end on, uh, we said last question. Is there a material we should use that is more fire safe, th that is both fire safe and sustainable, I think was the wording of it. Forgive me, I don't have the questions in front of me. Nick's reading them to me and I'm relaying them. So. It, a material that is both fire safe and sustainable, or do we have to choose one or the other? Is that right? Is there a material we could use that would be both highly fire safe and sustainable, or do we have to weigh more favourably towards one or the other? Really good question, and we did a whole one hour bit on this at a conference last year, a whole panel discussion. I, my opinion, it's not one or the other. I think there are materials out there that are both sustainable and fire safe. The question being, do we have to weigh more favorably towards one another? If you ask me, I'd say fire safe. Ask one of my sustainability colleagues, they'll say sustainable. I think it's a, a fact of bringing them both together. We had a good discussion about concrete being incredibly, uh, having really, really good fire properties, but being less sustainable. Whether that's true or not, from a really objective uh, position, that, that would be the case. Whereas timber's the inverse of that. But if we design timber correctly, it can be just as intrinsically safe as concrete. And vice versa, we can design concrete incorrectly so that actually, from a fire perspective, it doesn't always behave the way we'd want it to. So I don't think we have to weigh more favorably towards one or the other. I don't think it's a versus. Are you doing versus today? Fire safety versus sustainability? Yeah. Next presentation uh, a bit later today. I don't think they have to be adversarial. I think we can do both together. I think actually the, do we have to weigh more favorably towards one or the other? No, I think we have to bring them to more closely together actually uh, develop products for fire that are sustainable and develop sustainable initiatives that take into account fire safety as well yeah good um so that is the end of my presentation and the end of the questions i think nick um i'm gonna stick around for a little bit though for the next presentation so i can pick up some more um so it's just thank you from me i suppose there's my contact details there thank you again to maple and to sapphire for inviting me in um and yeah thank you very much i'll hand back to nick
So thank you, Joe. Really enjoyed your presentation there and, and taking us back through the kind of basics of fire safety and through the complexities of um, changing, ever-changing regulation. Um, my viewpoint is very much on the future direction of balconies and the impact on fire safety. And we will touch on the, the fire versus sustainability theme again. Um, keep the questions coming. It's useful um, to give context to these presentations. Uh, for those of you who don't know Sapphire, Sapphire was originally established in 1992. Um, so we've just had our 31st anniversary. We've sold 30,000 balconies in the last five years. Six and a half thousand balconies are due to be produced in, in 2023, that's across the nine UK factories. Um, Sapphire also have a production and showroom over in Toronto um, and also down in New Zealand. We're 100% focused on balcony design. Um, we've been part of the BS8579 committee who've written a new balcony standard which came out just a few years ago. And we also hold the record for installing 62 balconies in a single day. So as we go through, I'm not really going to touch on our products at all. Um, however, I'll just briefly give you an overview to give a bit of a additional context here. Um, the arms of the balcony, the first part, which are normally cast into the building at an early stage. Um, typically, it'd be almost a year later that you then bring in a pre-assembled cassette. So we pre-manufacture our cassettes like, like a car production, if you like. It's all assembled and it's assembled in, in a um, single one-piece flow. So the balcony comes entirely pre-manufactured and it's purely those last connections to the building which need doing, you're not fitting soffits and that sort of thing. And um, all and each and every stage of that process has been um, looked at very carefully so we can make sure that there's mechanical fixings, you can control the quality of those, but also every stage is also tracked with our Passport app, which means that every stage of production you can trace all the way back to who put what bolt on and what day in the factory and what their training was. The simplicity of the install is what gives it plus or minus 20 mil of tolerance and also what gives it the rapid install speeds of 62 balconies in a single day. And certainly um, not least at all um, is the, the safety first approach we take. And this is actually one of the topics we'll be looking at tomorrow um, as we look at balconies um, down in Leicester, which is one of our production factories, um, where we'll be looking at some new technology which actually um, creates a bit of a robotic an automated approach to install, making it safer and easier for installers. So the last thing people want to have a look at is a big long content list which you read through one by one. So I thought you might be more interested in seeing this as a Churchill style intro. So today we're not merely going to look at the future of balconies, we're going to delve into the past, we're going to look at what has trans transpired, what's happened already, what is taking place right now, um, and we're going to unravel some of those complexities and look at what will come um, into the future. And we've already touched on a few questions um, which, which Joe mentioned about laminate glass and some of the kind of um, very much theoretical directions of, of that at the moment. So we're going to take you on a journey. We're going to look at balcony materials. Um, it's quite, in, quite key to look at that before we look at any balcony fires and so on to understand how balconies have been changing over the years. We're going to look at laminate glass and we're also going to look at um, the impacts of um, planning and regulation on balconies for the future. So starting with balconies, our, our um, initial balcony was the first balcony we, we installed was slightly before Sapphire was actually formed back in 1989. Um, but at that stage, the majority of balconies were concrete platforms with basically an architectural balustrade around the outside. Now, as you can see on these pictures, the majority of those tend to be kind of fairly inset to the building. Um, a lot of walkways um, as part of that as well. Um, and concrete balconies um, tend to basically fill in and, and become a lot more integrated with the building facade than some of the other systems you'll see. And this was, in the UK, the most common method up until roughly about 2009, we had the GFC. Um, the largest building which we've worked on in concrete balconies was the Baltimore Tower um, in London and a 46-storey building, twisted tower, as you can see in the bottom right there. Um, and that is a, um, it was a concrete ring beam with balustrade attached to the outside and with a glass floor, a laminate, triple laminate glass floor. Um, the common feature of a concrete balcony, the first part is that you've got a thermal break, um, which is ten, tends to be a linear thermal break in the UK. Um, 
just in, of interest to people. Um, in North America, thermal brakes are not actually mandatory just yet in about me at all. Um, other than Quebec, which has adopted a code, and this is really new groundbreaking technology over there. It's obviously been banned mandatory in most areas of Europe for quite a while. Um, waterproofing surfaces used to be done like this. Um, this might be perhaps a bit more of an ugly one than some, um, but the point to note here is that often they were made of combustible materials. You then have 100% of the work done on site, um, so traceability, quality um, of, of the um, labour and the competency of that is very much um, about the site-based labour. Um, there'll be extensive scaffolding up the outside, there'll be loading out across that um, to get to the balconies and you've got what at that stage used to be the most common material which was a timber, generally a softwood decking, the sort of thing you might see in a and q or something like that. Steel balconies started becoming uh, much more common in roughly 20, um, 2009, 2010 time. Um, in the wake of the um, global financial crisis, um, people were trying to wrap packages together so they can buy them more competitively. Um, and this led to the steel balcony, bolt on balconies ultimately, as they're referred to often, uh, becoming far more common. Now, most of those at first, as you can see in the top left hand picture, were very very much a kind of rectangular box, if you like, just bolted onto the outside of the building, not very integral. Um, as years went by, um, balconies started getting a little bit more complex in those kind of shapes and so on. Um, and still balconies are still relatively common in the UK. So unlike a concrete balcony, you've got thermal breaks in smaller sections. What this means is you've got um, these independent areas which are penetrating through the cavity. So in, in that left-hand picture there, you can see there's actually five connections on a, on a balcony. Um, then the install is done from below. You have to leave those soffits off um, to be able to access those bolts. Um, because of that, it means about 30 to 40% of that work is done on site. Um, but it also means that soffits um, end up being emitted on a lot of balconies because it was cost saving. You know, two guys for two hours, four man hours, fixing that or even more um, on a taller building. Um, you can see that and also the inherent danger of fitting um, soffits at a high rise, on a high rise building. Um, that is still quite a common method of um, adding them afterwards, but also um, what we've seen with the fire regulations, um, the June amendment last year, just um, pretty much a year ago today, um, when we saw the, the additional requirements which recommended that balconies didn't have or had a non-perforate soffit. So that's one of the interesting requirements which has been changing. We'll touch a bit more about that a bit later on. Um, again, timber decking was still very much common at that stage. This for us merged together in, in 2014 into the glide on balcony concept, which is what you use today. So 100% of what we do um, is now um, the glide on system. The first project we installed was the small building at the top there, all 22 was installed in a single day. That was near Heathrow Airport. Um, the top right hand side is up in Glasgow, bottom left down in London, bottom right in Media City in Manchester. Um, and very much um, the process which is used across um, all the areas we work in North America, down in New Zealand and, and across an island. It's most similar to a bolt on balcony. You've got less thermal brakes um, because it's a lighter weight on the outside, which means you have less interface with the facade, less um, penetrations through. Um, less fire stopping and, and clashes with other things like cavity barriers. Um, install is done from the inside, only 5% of that is done work, work uh, on site. Um, that's really just the deck boards you can see there where the lifting points are connecting to it. Um, so very much more controlled process in factories. Because you don't need to fit those soffits underneath, it's actually cost neutral pretty much to have soffits. And what that, what that really is meant is that by far the most common method is people actually using a um, a control draining method of actually draining to the front edge and then um, using the um, front edge to drip down. Um, the most common decking material, and this really is twofold really. One is that when you've got pre-manufactured balconies, it's much easier to laser cut a hole and just in install a clip-based decking system like a wood plastic composite. But also you had this, this change in the marketplace at large for terrace areas, for all balconies really, where people start using wood plastic composites have become more and more competitive, a lot more options from China, particularly in the Far East. Um, and this was becoming common from about 2013, 14, 15 time, um, just pre-Grenfell basically. So now looking at a few balcony fires, and it's important that we look at these 
in the light of Grenfell as well. And as um, Joe mentioned, we're pretty much on the anniversary of Grenfell now. So there was a spree of balcony fires and the government had recognised this in 2016. They commissioned this report. Word of warning though, this report was, um, was written in 2016, pre-Grenfell. It's not particularly relevant now. However, at the time it said that evidence would suggest, which is what you can see highlighted here, um, that balcony um, fires had appeared to be becoming more common but weren't presenting a life safety risk. Now, in our opinion, this was always quite a flawed um, document in the fact that they were meant to be studying recent fires because of the increase, but the most recent at that time was 2011, so it's already five years out of date and there's a lot of change happening during that period of time. So picking out a few, this particular one here, uh, one of the most interesting fires um, I've come across and I've done a lot of work with fire brigades across the country um, researching balcony fires. Um, Joe mentioned the one in, in London which has happened fairly recently. There was also one in Dublin which happened two weeks ago with a stack of balconies um, with an enclosed fin beside it and there was a gas pipe within that fin. Um, so balcony fires continue. A lot of these ones are, are buildings built a, a while ago but this particular one wasn't very old at the time. Um, but what happened is you've got this balcony, which you can see top left-hand picture there, um, wood, um, exposed wood both from the, from the balcony above, the joists and so on, but also the deck surface with the softwood. But what happened here was somebody had a um, barbecue on the balcony and a coal fell onto a motorbike, which is parked on the balcony. Now, I can't tell you how that motorbike actually got onto the balcony in the first place. But this does show that user activity, what you put on your balcony, what you do on your balcony, makes a huge difference to building fire safety. Um, it was interesting to note um, just this week that Manchester Fire Brigade interestingly issued a um, statement about not, made, not using um, barbecues in your balconies, completely endorsed that um, and we actually did a piece with Manchester Fire Brigade a few years ago about balcony fire safety so if you'd like to have a look at that um, follow us on our, on our LinkedIn page because we repost that fairly recently. Now this was actually when our journey really intensified from a fire point of view. And this is just before Grenfell. Um, this was actually one of our balconies. And the reason we show this is because it shows the importance of using class A soffits. What you've got here on this balcony is you've got the left hand image there is one where you've got um, the, a wood plastic composite class C in this particular case. Um, somebody had been using a cigarette um, and had flicked it over the edge, landed a person below his beanbag, beanbag caught a light, the decking caught a light. Now this, interestingly, is a laminate glass um, balustrade as well. Um, the fire brigade, when they got there, the first thing they did was they, they cut out that, that glass panel and smashed it, removed it, um, so that they could actually fire, um, squirt their hoses um, in there and, and extinguish the fire. Um, but what you can see is that they've, they've then straight cut the boards to stop it spreading further down. Um, but you, you, the most important thing we learned from this is really the importance of using a class A soffit, because you can see there the balcony above, Yes, it's smoke damaged, um, but that was able to be cleaned up relatively easily. The balcony the fire occurred on had contained it, and this is really um, all about re reducing the spread of that fire. As, as Joe mentioned, if you've got a balcony um, or if you've got a fire coming out from one apartment and spreading up like we saw at the Lighthouse fire in the Northern Quarter in Manchester a few years back, um, it really makes those, all those cavity barriers and that compartmentation um, not very useful. So a typical balcony construction at the time of Grenfell was something like you see on the left there, an anchor onto a typical casting on this particular case, an off-shelf um, anchor system, and then being boxed around. You then had on the right-hand side, a, a glass balcony is by far the most common, particularly laminate glass at this stage. So it was typically a polystyrene-based anchor, um, so it would be um, combustible. Um, some kind of fireboarding you can see in that particular picture there around the outside um, and very much um, project specific um, fire stopping details generally created on site. Generally laminate glass, um, mainly using a class C composite decking, some are using class B at that stage but that would be a very small percentage of the marketplace. Um, wood seen timbers and so on generally admitted in favour of wood plastic composites because of their longer lifespan. Um, and the, mar the market generally transitioning across the soffits. So what about laminate glass? And it was interesting to have a few um, questions there, so thank you for those who asked about laminate glass. 
Sadly, laminate glass became popular because of a tragedy. The tragic incident which happened was up in Sheffield. You can see this picture here, where sadly a toddler fell through a gap in a monolithic balustrade. Now, monolithic balustrades are generally considered as banned um, under CDM Regulation 7 um, because of the falling glass, but also the inherent danger and post breakage like you see here. And it's a really tragic incident, but it was good to see the industry reacted in the fact that laminate glass became more and more common. Certainly monolithic, um, a huge recommendation from us is if you are seeing it used, stop. It's not a safe material. But BS618 um, 2011 um, saw laminate glass remove the requirement for having a second hammer on. The reason being is if you smash monolithic glass, um, this is what happens. So this is smashing most vulnerable point. Sorry about the quality of these videos. This was done back in um, 2009 when it was becoming more popular. Um, video technology fortune has moved on a lot since then. Um, so you see these shards of glass fall into the ground here. Um, and that's what's classified as a safety glass. Then you've got laminate glass. You've got the first layer of glass smashed and you can see it's being held together there. So believe it or not, that, the back part of that glass would be fairly um, smooth, even if you ran your hand down without a glove on. You then have the second panel protecting it. So you can see there the second panel is smashed. And this is why it became common, because the likelihood of seeing two together um, is quite low. I've seen it a few times, but I've been, I've been um, dealing with laminate glass for 17 years. And we've installed thousands of laminate glass panels across the world. Um, and this is something which I've seen just twice myself. One was when a crane um, from a, a building site adjacent to the building which had been finished had smacked into the side of the balustrade. Um, and the other occurrence was actually um, a building yet to be finished where a, um, a glass uh, door was open um, to the balcony um, during a, um, a storm. I think it was called Storm Gareth a few years ago. Um, and it was a project actually in Manchester up here where a door was ripped off its hinges and thrown into the side of the balustrade and took out both those glass panels. So quite a rare instant. But with that, people then start looking at what type of glass do we use heat strengthening, nickel sulfide, top, top picture there, um, smashing a very distinct butterfly pattern. Now, this hadn't been seen in monolithic glass because it just exploded, it'd go everywhere and nobody would really know the cause of it. Um, did a full circle back, um, but moving on from there, we then move into the post-Grenfell world. So, as I mentioned, the Fire and Lighthouse building in Manchester, um, I met with Manchester Fire Brigade um, and went and visited the site twice, actually, and spoke with the fire investigator on this one. Um, started a chip pan fight internally, was brought out onto the balcony, and then basically it spread from one balcony, one floor to the other. This was on um, New Year's um, Eve 2017 or the 31st of December 2017, um, where it spread all the way up to the 14th um, story there. Um, sadly, there's actually been a second balcony fire there since. Um, I believe the decking may not have been changed on all aspects of that building. Fortunately, it wasn't so significant, um, but the good news on that one is that nobody was actually injured. So we saw the fire Regulations obviously changing extensively following the Hackett report. We saw a consultation on the ban and subsequently the ban and the materials issued. During the process of that consultation, there was a number of balcony fires, the worst of which was this one here in West Hampstead, which was a um, instant. I met, um, I visited site there again. I met with the London Fire Brigade officer who had attended that fire. Um, and the investigation and the documents published by the insurers and, and various other bodies as well um, concluded that the fire started in a, um, from a cigarette butt in a plant pot which spread then up the, the building um, going in one balcony to the other um, because that um, combustible wood plastic composite was used on the underside of balconies and on the decking. Um, there was also a lot of damage internally both from smoke but also from sprinklers. So 28th of November 18 we saw the balconies, um, the exemption is published to which this is where the controversy started with laminate glass and um, where it was recognised in a window scenario but was left out, um, unfortunately, from a balustrade point of view. Now, this was flagged um, to the MHCLG. They confirmed to us at the time, um, just a few days later, that 
it was actually inadvertently missed. However, here we are, 2023. This is back in 2018. Um, and it's still not been added as an exemption list. That said, um, we like, like Joe um, mentioned um, on, on, from a research point of view, we're aware of lots of research. We're involved with lots of research with the government as well. Um, they reached out and asked us to write a white paper, which I'll touch on in a second. Um, but the, it's still very much actively being explored um, and there's some, there's some testing to further explore some real life scenarios as well. So watch this space. Um, I certainly feel confident there's light at the end of the tunnel in laminate glass, but again, that's opinion. Um, the other thing we don't know is how long the government piece of string is either. So it may not be soon. Um, the Barking Five, I believe this is the same one which was referenced earlier. Um, it was a, um, a balcony fire which started with a barbecue spread from one to another. Um, and the advice note, um, which was published straight after, that referred to um, the spread of fire and also recommended all balcony components which were combustible be replaced. Um, the particular reason for that one was that that building on the left-hand side had um, timber joining one balcony to the other. Um, so it was a very, very combustible structure. So June last year, um, we saw um, a number of other requirements come in. Um, very much um, of interest to us was the fact that a balcony section was added with various guidance to balconies, um, some of which needed clarity. Um, we more recently from the, from the Department of Leveling Up um, actually have had correspondence with them clarifying a few other bits which have been um, added as there was a term, a, uh, a note in there about using um, combustible materials on balconies which we sought clarity in, and that's available on our website if you have been confused by that same point. Um, but ultimately, really, there's been three significant big impacts to balconies um, in this post Grenfell world. The first being cavity fire protection. And this is something which um, most thermal breaks we're finding people are moving to a class A1, and that's good. Uh, moving away from polystyrene, um, in the case of our particular anchor, um, we used a, um, a mineral wall at the top, which was a class A1 anyway. Um, the second piece down the bottom um, was typically a class B, could be used as a class A non-compressible plate. Um, that said, we've moved um, away from that. We've got a new anchor, which is being launched tomorrow um, at the ResiBuild Roadshow in Leicester. Um, but the, um, the solution for that from ourselves is actually using a stub guard, which is this product here you see, which basically shrouds around the outside of the arm. This, you can actually see a live fire test, this being tested um, on the Belfast live stream, which is on the YouTube, Rizzybuild YouTube channel as part of the road show. So if you want to see um, how that tested and how that performed, it was good to see that it actually outperformed the cavity barriers, which are interfaced with it as well. So very much commonly used around the stub um, and shrouding that whole thermal break, whether or not that's combustible. Thermal breaks, I must add as well, are actually on the exemption list. So you can use combustible material, but we've seen the industry choose not to, which is good. Second thing is the deck and soffit materials have changed considerably. There's many new decking suppliers out there as well. Um, my deck is the one which we would tend to use, um, which have a non-combustible class A2 um, aluminium deck board, but they also have a class A1 um, composite material, um, which they um, use as well. Um, and certainly balconies um, having class A2 S1 D0 soffits um, and not non-perforate soffits as well. From a drainage point of view, non-perforate ones do not fulfill the requirements um, of BS8579 either. Um, and where, where we have seen those used in the past, um, it's quite quick to see the sort of staining and so on as water drips through a balcony and, and through a perforated soffit. Um, and balustrade choices have changed predominantly because of that laminate glass piece. So they've all gone to a class A2S1 D0. Um, but there's a severe lack of choice and the majority of people have been choosing a balcony which looks like this. Yes, looks nice in its own right. However, that very much limits the style because glass is very easily um, customised and so on and with prints and, and things like that. Then we had something called COVID, which you probably most of you remember. Um, during that period, we saw people fall in love with their balconies like never before. Um, this top right picture here actually is a resident which was interviewed um, by The Guardian. And The Guardian published an article, um, they interviewed us um, on it as well, about the golden era of balconies, as they called it. 
Um, and this really was talking, this particular resident chose to um, change balcony, uh, change apartments um, because of the fact it had a balcony and you can imagine being locked in an apartment without a balcony must have been quite daunting for many people. Now, there's interestingly two pieces of research or two findings from research done by Skies with the apartment communities. Um, this I thought was quite interesting. The first one is that wind protection and privacy are by, by far the biggest issue um, to residents about balustrading on their balconies and so on. The second thing is what you see is the vast majority of people, more than 80% of people, um, sorry, almost 70% of people, um, of the re residents actually want a taller balcony balustrade um, than what the regulations require. Now, that's quite an interesting point for us, and we'll come back to that in a second, really. So, now we've moved to Class A balconies. Does that mean that fire risk in balconies is reducing? Well, this is one client who voluntarily stepped ahead of their time, if you like, um, um, stepped into choosing a Class A um, balcony solution before it was actually mandated to them. Um, now, this here is one photo of just one facade of that building, and, and Joe, you've probably seen countless buildings like this, where what you can see is a building which has got a Class A product when it was installed, but does that mean it's, it's safe from a fire risk point of view? No, ultimately what we're seeing is that many residents, uh, residents inside these apartments are going out and buying windbreaks, they're buying privacy screens and so on. And funny enough, actually, I was actually in, in B&Q at the weekend um, and I heard a couple discussing about um, the need for, for um, getting a wicker screen on their balcony um, to stop the wind. Um, and that's the, um, that's the whole kind of concept here really of laminate glass is that um, in the white paper which was, um, which was commissioned by the MHCLG from us, um, there were several findings around this whole wind piece here. So is it goodbye laminate and hello confusion? Where do we stand with, with glass? Um, glass was chosen mainly um, for wind. It's a very good material, but it's also translucent as well, unlike a privacy screen. That gives people the option of view um, or patterns and so on, as you can see in that middle picture there. So what are the options? We've got on the left-hand side the Baltimore Tower, a nice iconic building in London. Twisted tower, laminate glass floors, Nope, we can't use it, it's banned um, because it's laminate glass. We can't use screen printing on glass either, um, other than uh, a privacy screen in, in a balcony, in the middle of a balcony, exam for example, where it's not guarding a drop, you can use monolithic glass and you can therefore um, use screen prints and so on inside that. Um, but what about monolithic? No, again, it's banned under the CDM and Regulation 7. So what about laminate glass? More generally, now this is something which we've been doing a lot of testing on um, ever since it was banned back in 2018. Um, we've done lots of fire tests on various different types of laminate. There is one which has got a Class A certificate um, and we've done a lot of testing about uh, on the, this particular solution is what you see this in our test lab in Reading. Um, and that has actually got a gel-based insulator. Now a gel-based insulator means two things really. It's not a sheet like um, PVB or EVA and therefore it behaves quite differently. Um, both under structural um, tests like this, where you've got a line load being applied, um, you've got a lot more creep in that. Um, so it behaves differently from a structural point of view. But the second and more major part of that is that if, a, if both panels break, it doesn't hold together in a sheet like you saw in the videos earlier. It smashes into big sharp shards, so that's what we found when under testing. And that fundamentally is a safety risk. Um, this isn't a particular project we, uh, product we would offer and we, we continue to search the market but one of the big warnings which we discovered here is that some fire testing certificates um, for products actually achieve a class A1 rating by using a big size, by using a thick glass panel and by getting any combustible elements within that under the 1% where the EN1996 said that if it was below 1% you could, it could be assumed to be a class A1. Now, this is something which, if you change the parameters of that, if you use a smaller glass panel or a thinner glass panel, would it still have a Class A rating? It's very unlikely. And this is one of the, the issues which we 
um, suggest that you, you certainly um, have a consideration of. The other thing to be mindful of is um, the long-term situation, particularly in the fact that this isn't known to be UV stable. Um, what happens a few years down the line if you have to replace it or it starts failing? Um, there isn't really any other solutions out there. So where are we left with glass? For us, the only option really, and um, we're only seeing this as a, a very much temporary fix, we're seeing some architects specify it an early stage, um, but using strips of monolithic glass where you can work with the CDM requirements of designing out that risk, you've got much smaller panels there, which if one's smashed, you haven't got a, a second um, big open space there which somebody could fall through, so very small amount there, uh, but also only a very small amount of falling potential of falling shards. But what about the future? Certainly, Class A, does it equals fire safety? In reality, it may be, but it might not be. Um, certainly there's a fire hazard with balconies. We, we actually did this test here, you can see this picture, um, in conjunction with um, the Royal Berkshire Fire Brigade. We burnt a, a life-size balcony, um, furnished in the worst case possible. You know, combustible decking, wicker chair, combustible cushion on it, pot plants made of plastic, um, and again, a um, screen there. So we, we, did, we did this as part of that, um, that government white paper. And our conclusion is if you're not giving people privacy and you're not giving people um, wind protection, people will seek that by, them, by themselves generally with combustible materials. One thing we're seeing happen with planning permissions is that with the gateway, um, the gateways and the clarity around that, we're looking, we're seeing people making decisions earlier, um, but there's still a lot of confusion with this. Um, for sure, we're, I, I think we're going to see a lot more confusion between now and, and October as well, when it all um, really kicks off. But again, um, we're also seeing wind become more of a consideration to planners. It's basically because we've gone through that stage of people actually having a balcony which is just vertical bars, and residents complaining and kicking off um, to social housing providers and so on about the fact that their balcony is very windy. Um, and so we're seeing some planning missions which have got a clause in it for actually using wind protection in your balconies. How do you do that at the moment? Basically with a solid screen. So this is another interesting piece by, by ResiBuild. Um, there's some research findings in November 2022. Um, and these were the key topics which people were looking at. Fire, carbon, regulations, embodied, um, sustainability, zero. These are all common themes we're seeing. So is there a bright future for balconies? And is it fire versus sustainability? More metal, less metal. You know, fire on the left there, sustainability on the right. Class A versus more insulation. Um, testing materials only versus reusing of old materials. Um, concrete versus CLT already been touched on today as well. Are we facing a showdown on is it a choice? That question was a good one in terms of um, materials. I think it very much depends on what product you're choosing as to how much choice you've got around this. But certainly from a balcony point of view, for us, less penetrations is good for sustainability. It means there's less embodied anchor in that, less embodied carbon in that anchor. It also means there's less thermal heat loss from the building. But it also means from a fire point of view, you've got less interfaces, there's less interruption of that cavity barrier. Offsite manufacture is good for sustainability. Um, it's much more controlled, the part L requirements as well we're seeing. Um, the need for um, photos and traceability. It's a good thing, easy to be done on an off-site manufacturer. Again, from a fire point of view, the accountability of factories and the whole traceability piece um, for photos all the way through. Um, and if, if any of you are interested in seeing this, um, there is a live um, factory tour at our Leicester facility tomorrow as part of the, ro um, the ResiBuild Roadshow. Ethics, we've seen sadly in the Grenfell inquiry um, and if you haven't seen it it's well worth having a look at the um, summary statement there you see a big web of different people blaming each other what we've seen is ethics of companies which haven't um, performed versus those who have actually um, chosen to make conscious and correct decisions and particularly around fire testing and, and um, the information and transparency around that what was held back or what was publicly made available um, no difference with sustainability really. Greenwashing versus making ethical choices. A lot of ESG is around making the right choices um, 
for the community the right choices um, in what you're doing from a um, sustainability point of view and helping the climate. Um, certainly a science-based approach, science-based targets we have for sustainability, but certainly um, taking things back to the basics. We looked at some of the basic principles of fire safety, and this is all good practice from a fire point of view, but also from a sustainability point of view, basically becoming much more data-led. But the role of innovation has a more important role than ever before, really, both from a fire point of view, um, overcoming challenges, and we're seeing that with... with um, with glass, understanding the parameters of that, um, creating products which will actually fulfil both regulatory requirements but also the purpose of which they're intended as well. Um, and certainly from a sustainability point of view, um, innovation has a huge role in reducing and producing low carbon um, solutions, co solutions which bring us down towards that net zero world. So certainly what we're likely to see more of Offsite production, um, we're certainly um, likely to see more and more of. Um, a drive to measure and demonstrate competency, we'd like to see a lot more traceability digitally. Ethics, not a nice to have anymore, they're a must. Um, increasing testing and science based decisions, um, dependence on innovation um, as well, very much more likely. And I think personally that we're going to see a future with laminate glass. I do think there's going to be um, and I don't say this just as a, as a, as a pot shot in the dark, um, but I think the government are going to issue a white paper about how you can safely use laminate glass. Now, that is only based on what I know. What, unfortunately, we're, we've got a um, non-disclosure agreement in place um, on a lot of the testing and so on, which we've been doing, so I can't really say much more than that. We do think you should consider your safety height, your, stand, your um, fire approach and certainly the way you treat balconies very much um, regardless of height um, endorse what Joe was talking about earlier it's not really about size it's about the kind of scenario and, and everything which goes with that as well um, look to always use soffits in your balconies it's not about cost it's about uh, making intelligent safety decisions both from a fire point of view but also hot liquids and so on as well um, certainly aim to reduce the amount of penetrations in your building talk to us if you want any help with that. Um, using simp simplistic innovation um, and products which mean less reliance on skilled labour doesn't mean that you don't have competent and skilled labour, it means that there's less reliance on the skills of an individual. So for example one of the things we've done is we've changed away from using welded structures to using mechanically fixed ones where you can make sure that you've got the torque settings right, you've got witness marks and the bolts similar to um, what you see when you go into an aeroplane on the doors there you see bolts and you see witness marks and so on it's making it much more reliant on the process and not on the people themselves and certainly we'd, we'd recommend um, furthering your knowledge on from a fire point of view um, certainly resi build is one of the key providers of that so may we conclude with balconies have for, for too long been considered merely as metal structures um, but it's time for us to broaden our horizon and look at this as, a, as somewhere where people live. What we want to look at is the unison between fire safety but also balcony safety and sustainability as well as, all, as part of our decision making process. And not just considering the end result being a sign off by building control but also as somewhere where somebody's going to live and enjoy that space and how they might use that is, is a big part of that choice as well. But again, um, it's not just about the now and the present, it's also being mindful of um, the future and generations to come um, and also regulations to come. Thank you very much. Um, if you wish to connect with me on LinkedIn, um, there's the code here. But for now, um, it's goodbye from us and we'll see you, we'll see you tomorrow um, at Leicester. Thank you very much um, to Maple for hosting us. Thank you for our, um, Joe for speaking and the contributions from Delta Fire. Um, and again, we look forward to seeing you on the next live stream.
So we've got a couple of questions here in relation to the SAFAR presentation. I'll just answer quickly. Um, the first one is, can a balcony be part of a fire prevention strategy for the whole building, i.e. through materials that might dampen a fire? Um, interesting question. Um, certainly, there's not... From a passive fire protection point of view, there are components which we would supply around the anchors and so on. The stub guard is one we've looked at, and that's what we tested back in Belfast last week. Um, in terms of active methods for dampening a fire, sprinklers and that sort of thing. Um, interestingly, other countries, particularly um, the Middle East and over in Australia and so on, you often see balconies with sprinklers. Um, this was actually a point which was discussed at the panel discussion um, at London Build as well, wasn't it, Jay? Um, about whether sprinklers should be used like that and, and kind of a belief that sprinklers couldn't be used externally. Um, well, this isn't really something which is which is a common request at the moment. Um, certainly as part of a safety strategy, a balcony's fit into the overall building strategy as opposed to it reducing the risk of other as aspects of the balconies. That said, um, jet jetting flame is quite a common one. Um, we've seen a few other requirements like extending soffits to actually cause turbulence with smoke and that sort of thing as well. Um, but no, not really. The second question, um, looks like it might have come from LinkedIn. Um, here it says, does a balcony need fire testing as a complete system? What prevents a system melting or glass detaching and falling down the building like a guillotine? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, there is some full-scale full mock-ups being, um, being tested, and that's something which we will um, be reporting on as that, and when that happens. Um, but in essence... There's not one dedicated fire test for balconies. Um, balconies are a relatively niche product, um, and there's many different tests in, for different um, ones. So, for example, a combustibility test, which you'd use for deck systems, is different from what you're testing um, the anchors and so on within the cavity. And that's about the insulation and the integrity. Um, the one we did in, in um, the test lab in, in Belfast with Effectus, that was a two hour test, um, and that was looking for. 180 degrees above ambient being the maximum temperature it would exceed to. So there's various tests with various different methods in the same way as that lots of the structural testing, there's different ones for the floor load, there's different requirements for the balustrade line load, for impact and so on. In terms of glass falling and detaching and falling from building, great point. Um, the critical thing here really is twofold. One is actually having mechanical fixings through it. We're big believers in making sure that you're fixing those components together. So if you did have laminate glass, if in the unlikely scenario of that, um, that balcony um, glass um, interlayer actually melting out, it would still be held to the balcony structure. That said, if the balcony is becoming hot enough for creating devastating effects like this, you've got quite a major fire in your hands. Um, at Grenfell Tower, at many other um, fires, um, one of the things which has um, been flagged as falling materials, and at that West Hampstead fire, which was um, a laminate glass one there, you can see the explosion of that, that glass um, when it got hot enough on those balconies in its, in its own right. But one of the things the, um, the officer I spoke to at the London Fire Brigade mentioned about that particular fire was that the balcony had a lot of glued on components. So it had glued on fascias and various other bits and pieces. Um, and this is something they, they highly recommended against. And the reason being was there's no mechanical fixing. So when that ceiling got too hot, I don't know what sealant had been used, by the way, but you can, you can actually see it in some of the, the um, reports which were done following that fire. Um, but you, you basically had metal soffits falling down from the buildings. Probably metal soffits um, is an even bigger risk because the likelihood of a glass panel falling in one piece is probably quite rare in that respect. But certainly mechanical fixings are the big recommendation from us. I, I don't know if you've got any, any uh, recommendations on that question, Jay, particularly. No, I was just reading on LinkedIn as well. I, saw it. I wondered if you were going to come to it. Um, <clears throat> um, no, just, just to pick up on the point about falling components is now a huge part of certainly operational firefighting. Can you hear that? Okay. Is that coming through? Um, yeah, big components. Certainly from, from Grenfell, we're talking about cladding components falling. The largest one that I'm aware of was about 40 kilograms that fell off the tower and fell multiple stories. So that's a huge risk. So it would be a consideration, but there isn't a test for that. Uh, to answer the question directly, but certainly something that we'd consider from an operational 
firefighting perspective. Um, yeah, it's an interesting um, thought piece, I suppose, for us to consider, in, because that as a failure mode is not an inherent fire uh, spread condition, but from a fire strategy perspective, we need to consider that under regulation B5, because that would impact firefighting operations. Mm. So it's an interesting thought piece, but there isn't currently a test for it from a fire perspective. Certainly, uh, then in the context of the, the person asking it, but the, if, if it's a developer or, or somebody in the, in the construction world, talk to your balcony supplier, um, ask that traceability, go all the way back down as to what that kind of risk, how people have measured and, and um, weighed that up. Um, certainly mechanical fixings is something to look at, but also how do you make sure that that, as, as Joe, you mentioned, when you're taking panels off of, off of a facade um, and discovering things which are not as they were meant to be, um, how is your manufacturer, um, whether that be a balcony manufacturer or any manufacturer, how are they actually making sure that what is actually on those drawings originally is actually what is ending up on site? Um, from our point of view, um, we're more than happy to talk you through the Passport app and the way we actually take that, that piece of competence in. Let's not be forgetful of the fact that um, very soon um, it's going to be mandatory to prove competency of workers. And that's all the way back through the supply chain, so understanding what who's done what in, on a balcony, who's signed that off, where that, where, where that goes all the way back down the chain as to what their training was originally. Um, and certainly for us, um, innovation plays a critical role in actually reducing the dependence on skilled labour, but also we play a key role in training up people, both site-based operatives um, on theory and practical, but also our own in-house people as well. Thank you very much and goodbye from us.